Peru is now the world's largest exporter of cocaine. The government is taking a new approach to tackle the problem by getting tough on traffickers and encouraging farmers to grow other crops instead of coca. You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Peru has now overtaken Colombia as the largest cocaine exporter in the world. Some regions produce huge quantities of coca leaves and coca paste, which is then turned into pure cocaine destined for Europe, Asia and Latin America. Until recently, the government did very little to tackle the problem, making Peru an obvious choice for drug traffickers looking to move from Colombia, where they were hunted by the police and U.S.-backed troops. At times, the government tried a policy of eradication, that is forced elimination of coca crops by burning or spraying them with chemicals. But many consider this strategy a failure because farmers found other parts of land for coca production. But the new president, Ollanta Humala, is introducing a new strategy to contain the explosion of drug trafficking and the corruption that comes with it. First, the government wants to help farmers plant alternative crops such as bananas and coffee. Second, they want to increase the state's investments in infrastructure projects in the area dense with coca farming. That could mean more schools and roads. And lastly, Umala says he'll go after the drug traffickers and their money. The Maoist rebel group known as Shining Path in particular will be targeted. Al Jazeera's Lucia Newman traveled to the Vrai Valley, the world's most densely planted coca region, and sent us this report. This is a coca field in Peru's Vrai Valley, which has now become the world's number one producer of the raw material of cocaine, the coca leaf. In fact, Peru has not only now surpassed Colombia as the number one producer of this plant, but it has also become the world's first or largest exporter of cocaine. And that's not because Peru produces more than Colombia, but because so much less of it is actually confiscated in this country. Now, the farmers who, who make their living from coca leaves say that they know that they are producing for an illegal business, but they say that they're going to continue to do it until they're given the financial and also the technical support that will allow them to produce alternative crops that at least pay about as much as coca. This is a very isolated part of the country. The illegal drug business has another unexpected ally, and that is the reemergence of the Shining Path, a Maoist guerrilla group which was thought to have been wiped out about two decades ago, but which has now regrouped and which is offering protection to drug traffickers for a price. All this is causing a great deal of concern, both in Peru and abroad, which is why this country's president is now launching a new anti-drug policy, which is not based on the idea of eradicating coca leaf, despite a lot of pressure from the United States, but rather on the idea of going after the traffickers directly, both their money and the precursor chemicals that they use here to, fa to make the cocaine and the coca paste, as well as a bigger presence of the state here in the Vrai Valley, where there is very little, if any, at this moment. All this, of course, is going to cost a lot of money. It means development, bringing, bringing roads, schools, as well as technical and financial support for thousands of people who need to be weaned from their dependence on the coca leaf, their economic dependence on coca. And w this has been done before. Experience has shown that it can be done, but it will take billions, not millions of dollars, and a lot of time. <music> So will Peru's new drug policy be successful? To discuss this, I'm joined from Lima, Peru, by journalist and filmmaker Luis Del Valle. And here in the studio, I'm joined by Kevin Casas Zamora, the former vice president of Costa Rica. He's currently a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And Sanjo Tree, the director for the Drug Policy Project at the Institute for Policy Studies, also here in Washington. Gentlemen, welcome to all of you to the show. I'm going to start off with Luis Del Valle in Lima. Now, you've been tracking the emergence of Peru as a major producer and exporter of cocaine. How and why did that happen? Because it seems that Peru has gone full circle. You know, in the 90s, it was a producer, but the government was able to contain the production of cocaine at that time. But now it's re-emerged and is now the world's number one producer. How did it happen? Well, I think... Um well, first of all, Peru has always been a, 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 a major player in, in this business, unfortunately. Um, but I think that this all has to do with uh, what has been happening in Colombia, actually, and the results that uh, 
the policies against frogs uh, in Colombia have been uh, producing in, in this part of, of the country or in this part of the region. Um, I understand that uh, Colombia produces uh, more cocaine, but uh, authorities there has managed to stop a big amount of, of the drug, while in Peru, although the country p produces less, authorities uh, haven't been able or haven't been as successful as uh, their counterparts in Colombia and haven't been able to stop as, as much uh, cocaine as in Colombia. That has made that uh, Peru uh, is now the main exporter of the drug. Okay, yeah, we have some figures here on actually the production figures. Let's take a look at the state of coca leaf production. Uh, according to the United Nations, three countries, Peru, Colombia, and Bolivia, are responsible for close to 100% of global coca leaf production. Now, while Colombia's coca production has been decreasing, Peru's is on the rise, and last year even surpassed its northern neighbor. Kevin, uh, the government in Peru is now uh, looking at a new strategy and that strategy includes uh, encouraging farmers to plant alternative crops, putting more money for infrastructure development in these areas where coca is produced and also going after the uh, drug traffickers as well. Is that a winning strategy? Well, that's everybody's question. I mean, it, it may work for a time. It may work uh, if the government is willing to invest uh, considerable uh, amounts of money, number one, which is a tall order for a country, by the way, that collects about 16% of GDP in taxes, which is next to nothing. And it's, it might work also if the, if the government is able to improve its bureaucratic capabilities, which in most cases, you know, uh, are beyond uh, uh, the reach of most last, uh, Latin American governments. I mean, these are very complex uh, bureaucratic projects to, to, to set in motion. So I think, you know, it, it might work in the best of cases for a time. And this, I guess, suggests a, a deeper reflection on, on what the, the war on drugs is all about. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that at this point we're clear uh, that the best you can hope for in the war on drugs is to dump your, your problem on your neighbors. Sanjo, what is your view? Is the government on the right track here in its attempt to sort of counter the production of cocaine? It's a fresh approach. Uh, I think it's one that's long overdue. Uh, Peru has been a very obedient student of U.S. drug policies. They've uh, done it our way for many, many decades now, and look where it's gotten them. The idea of forced eradication, I think, is a fallacy. We need to get, put that aside. We can talk about gradual reduction in cultivation, but the idea that you can forcibly eradicate this stuff from the entire region, uh, I think, is, is hopeless. One of the reasons Peru has such a big coca crop now is partly because of Plan Colombia that after a decade of forced eradication and fumigation uh, in Colombia and more than $7 billion spent, we still have a huge problem in Colombia and now we've also pushed it back into, into Peru. Ten years ago, at the beginning of Plan Colombia, about 90% of U.S. cocaine originated from Colombia. Earlier this year, when I met with the U.S. Drug Czar's office, they updated their statistics. They said now 97% of United States cocaine originates from So Columbia. the United States still gets the bulk of its cocaine yes. from Colombia. Absolutely. Right. Um, you know, you mentioned forced eradication. Uh, we have been talking to Ricardo Soberon, who is the drug czar in Peru. He's been uh, charged with uh, fighting the country's drug war. Al Jazeera spoke to him, and this is what he had to say about the country's eradication policy. Let's take a listen. We don't believe that eradication is an effective way of, of approaching to the issue of coca crop. Because eradication basically means the disappearance of one plant without being sure that that plant will be uh, cultivated again 10 meters uh, further uh, from the place that it has been eradicated. Due to other political and social reasons, we will not, never eradicate in Bray. It's impossible. It's a fuel in order to b make Shining Path uh, to grow sustainably. So here we have Ricardo Sabaron, the drug czar in Peru, saying exactly what you said just a moment ago. Um, one other question is, is he the right man for the job? I think he is the indispensable person for this job in the sense that he is someone who actually knows the lives of these coca growers. He's been to these regions. He knows the players. He understands their reality, which is something that's very different from conventional um, counter-narcotics uh, specialists who 
reside in capital cities. Um, they, their feet hardly get dirty. Uh, and, you know, it's not until you get into the mud that you realize what these farmers are up against. They are forced to grow um, a lot of this coca because it's the only crop that's viable in these regions. There are no roads that we would recognize as roads that are passable. Uh, to, so we can't tell them to grow thousands of kilos of bananas and pineapples and yucca to transport on vehicles they don't have over roads that literally don't exist to sell in both the markets, both domestic and export, they can't get access to. And even if they could, to compete against cheap agribusiness imports, very often subsidized by our tax dollars, against which they don't stand a chance. Okay, it, it, go ahead. It, it's, it's very important to understand the economics of this in, in two ways. Number one, these are very remote areas. Uh, where the only way to make a living is to produce very valuable crops because otherwise the, the transaction costs to get your produce to the market are just too high. But for the Peruvian government, there's also a political dimension to the manner in which they behave. I want to go back to Luis del Valle in Lima. Uh, one of the things that Ricardo Soberan told us uh, in our interview with him was that he will not enforce the forced eradication program in the Vry Valley which astounded us in a way because that is the place where the bulk of Peru's cocaine is produced. What do you make of that? Yeah, I was, I was in that interview and to be very honest with you, that was a big surprise because the, the Vraya, as you said, is, is the biggest valley, uh, coca valley in, in the country and there is no way that a successful uh, drugs policy in the country could be applied without considering uh, some sort of eradication in, in the Vrai. I must say that uh, is, it is also true that uh, to start eradication in the Vrai at this moment is almost impossible. I've been there several times and I can tell you that almost 90 to 95 percent of the economy in that region of Peru depends on coca. Uh, so it is true what Soberon says, but at the same time, I can understand why some analysts are a bit skeptical about the fact that uh, any successful uh, drug policy could take place in the country without considering eradication in the biggest coca valley in this country. So, Sanjo Tree, let me ask you this. If uh, Richard Soberon says he's not going to enforce that policy in the Vry Valley, uh, is it destined for failure then? No, in fact, I think, you know, I think it, it, it's good that he said this because he's learning some of the lessons from the failures of Plan Colombia, that there are two competing agendas here. One is counter-narcotics and the other is counter-insurgency. And if you alienate these peasant farmers, these coca growers, and don't give them any alternatives, if you only eradicate, you will lose, you will not only alienate them from the state, you will lose their hearts and minds. You'll, you'll provide them every reason to be sympathetic to the guerrillas, to right. the Sierra Luminoso. So, so Kevin, it becomes a security issue, right, then for the government. It is, it is, and it's, a, it's actually a political issue as well. I mean, let us not forget what happened in Bolivia, where forced eradication, what managed to achieve was to politicize in a very, in a very visible and, and nasty way, uh, 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 the, the issue. So uh, uh, what this speaks to is the fact that governments in the region, uh, you know, and uh, administrations such as President Umala's, uh, find themselves walking a very tight uh, uh, line. You know, uh, they they have political pressures from their their constituencies at home, but they also have. A very significant international pressures uh, uh, coming mostly from the U.S. to do certain things, and uh, it's very difficult to to walk on that tightrope. And many, you know, it's very often uh, very often the case that many of the things that they do don't necessarily correspond to what they actually think will work. And this is very important. I mean, this dissonance between what policymakers say in public and what they say in private is pervasive in Latin America. Well, it happens all over the world. Sana, let me ask you this as well. Um, one of the plans that the government is looking at is, is uh, providing cash, encouraging farmers to grow alternative crops. Uh, have they had much success with that strategy? It depends on how you look at it. If you look at from the point of view of, of food security, helping these peasant farmers so that they don't panic after you force it. In the past, we've forcibly eradicated and they have to wait a long time, perhaps years, before any development assistance arrives. They panic. 
what else can they do in these regions? They can't grow other crops because there's no access to markets, there's no credit. They panic and the question becomes, how do I feed my family next week, next month, next year? Well, what is the one crop they know how to grow that is easy to transport without adequate roads and infrastructure for which there are willing buyers? That, of course, are the illicit crops, like coca. Uh, and that's, that's exactly what we've seen happen in Colombia. So I've been, you know, Colombia, we've given now $7 billion, more than $7 billion to help fight our war on drugs for the past decade. And yet I have recently talked to high-ranking military people in Colombia in prime coca-growing regions where there's a lot of guerrilla presence. And they will actually inform coca farmers it's better if you harvest your coca crops this week because next week you're going to get eradicated. They cannot afford to alienate the peasant farmers. As, the, as, as this officer put it to me, the intelligence must flow from the peasants to the army about guerrilla troop movements and never, ever, ever the other way around. And, and, and there's another element in this which has to do with the economics of the situation as well. You have to consider that the farmer in Peru, say, gets about 1% of the retail price of cocaine in the US, right? So that means that traffickers have a very significant scope to raise uh, what they actually pay for the, for the coca leaf. Uh, so it is very difficult to fight against that. You know, even in the best of circumstances, even if they're investing heavily, you know, in roads and infrastructure and what have you, you know, the, the, the economics of the situation it's able to defeat the best intentions. Okay, let's go to uh, Luis Del Valle in Lima again. Luis, what do you make of the government strategy, that three-pronged strategy that they're talking about, alternative crops, more investment, and going after drug traffickers? Uh, I think it's very, very difficult. Uh, but as someone has, has already said, I think that Sovereign is probably uh, one of the persons that knows best the situation of farmers in these uh, coca valleys. And I think that uh, the Malas governments understand quite well that the farmer is at the bottom of, of this chain where there, I there are you know, hundreds of people around working in the business and the farmer is the one that probably gets uh, the, uh, the less amount of money for what he does. So. Um, I think that the government is trying to put emphasis on that, on that respect, and that's why uh, it is mentioned and mentioning that he's going to tackle uh, the networks of, of drug trafficking and all that. Certainly, it's a huge task because, as we all know, corruption is uh, very present here in this business, and it's very, very difficult to fight against that. So. Um, that's why I, I think that it is right also to say that here in Peru, analysts are skeptical about uh, you know, what's going to happen with this plan because uh, it's like fighting against a, a huge monster and nobody knows whether this government can, can make any success on this. Okay. And I mean, <laughs> bottom line, we've been here before. And you know, the question is whether, you know, why Will this be better this time around? Okay. Well, at this point, I want to bring in uh, the United States and its sure. uh, its role in fighting this uh, the drug war in Peru. Now, let's take a look at the scope of Peru's drug fight. Now, the country receives money from the United States, the world's largest cocaine consumer, by the way. Last year, American anti-narcotics aid for Peru was around seventy million dollars. Of that, thirty-eight million went to law enforcement, which includes training police and prosecutors and some 32 million went to so-called alternative development or helping farmers plant legal crops like coffee. As for troops involved in the drug fight, there are 4,500 in the Vrai region alone. Now, when we look at this, and there's 4,500, I should say, are Peruvian troops, uh, sure. which are in the uh, Vrai region. Um, the United States had a significant amount of success in Plan Colombia, but they involved the military being involved. Uh, in Colombia as well. Is it likely that the US military could get involved in Peru? Kevin? I doubt it. I mean, I doubt it that they will get involved in the same way they did, they did in Colombia. And besides, you know, I, it is very useful to examine carefully what happened in Colombia. I mean, in the case of Colombia, close to $8 billion were, were invested, you know, from US taxpayers. 
and all you achieved was pushing the problem to the neighbors. Well, they call that the balloon effect, don't they? That's the balloon effect. I mean, you squeeze, you squeeze on, one, on side, one side, it swells on the other side. Shoveling water is another analogy. So, I would use. you know, I I what seems to be at stake here is that, you know, we really need a more fundamental rethinking of the whole approach. Because now, the approach based on eradication and interdiction, uh, quite frankly, in the long run, the effects of that have been debatable at best. Okay, that fundamental re-evaluation that you're talking about, Sanjo, does that include the consumer countries doing something about it? Absolutely. Uh, and now you're getting a, m a much greater chorus coming out of Latin America and the rest of the world mm -hmm. talking about Look, if the United States and other consuming countries can't reduce demand, then we have to talk about legalization. Or in diplomatic speak, they call it uh, market alternatives. But basically, we have to look at prohibition. The problem is the economics of drug prohibition that takes these minimally processed agricultural commodities that are worth pennies per dose. I mean, it's very easy to produce cocaine and heroin and, and cannabis. It's, it's not difficult at all. And there's no reason on earth they should be worth the prices they are in the streets of the United States. But it, this is the catch-22 of the drug war. The more we escalate the drug war, the, the higher the possibility these traffickers will get caught, the longer the prison sentence they might have to serve, the more danger there is to them, the higher the risk premium they're allowed to charge the next person down the smuggling chain. So what we do through the drug war, uh, the more we wage it, the more of an indirect price support we give to the drug traffickers, to insurgents, to terrorists, to uh, peasant farmers. Right. So this is the catch-22. Well, you know, Ricard, uh, go ahead. Oh, oh, oh tell you something else. I mean, it, when you look at the, uh, the history of the war on drugs, quite frankly, after spending billions and billions upon billions of dollars, all that the U.S. has achieved it, is to move the epicenter of the drug trade closer to the U.S., that is in Mexico. Okay, yes. Now, Ricardo Sobron actually has recognized the need for international help. We, in that, we have uh, an excerpt from that interview that he did with us. He says that Peru needs more assistance from other countries. This is what he said about receiving international help. More cooperation, definitely. And I prefer fresh dollars rather than old bullets. I prefer uh, good intelligence rather than canyons and tanks. I prefer more markets rather than more policing. I think that's the only way to attack the real structure of the problem. Okay, let's go to Luis Del Valle in uh, Lima. Uh, politically, what kind of uh, international help, let's put it that way, is acceptable in Peru? I mean, would Peru be amenable to something like Plan Colombia? Would there be a Plan Peru? I doubt. Um, honestly, as uh, Soberon has said, I think that uh, Umala and his government is looking uh, for a different approach uh, from the international community. Um, there has been uh, pilot experiences uh, on, on certain valleys uh, where they have replaced coca with coffee or with fruit and uh, with the help of the U.S. Uh, development branch, the USAID, there has been um, successful stories of, of uh, areas that used to, used to have uh, coca and now they're uh, harvesting, uh, well, they're having coffee or, or other crops. So I think that that's the kind of thing that uh, this new government is looking for and the international help I think it's going to be focused on, on that, trying to help Peru on uh, having markets, new markets, uh, infrastructure, development projects. And uh, Soberon knows uh, this quite well because I think he has been uh, involved on that uh, before. So I think that's, that's the kind of approach that uh, Peru is looking at the moment rather than helicopters or military presence in in these valleys. Okay, and you are going to have the last word on that. We've run out of time. Thanks to all of you for joining us. That's it from the team here in Washington, D.C. for now. But we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send us your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AljazeeRa.net.